Well, I am super excited for uh, us to do this trunk or treat. I think it's going to be an incredible gift to our community. Uh, my first uh, year uh, here last Halloween, and my, my neighborhood does something kind of cool, but, uh, but really just seeing that this is an opportunity for us to create an, a unique experience for so many families here in the surrounding area. But like Jennifer said, it requires you guys. And so we do want people to sign up to, to host a trunk. We're looking for 75 trunks. So that's like our minimum number. So just in case I'm not clear, I'm talking to you. Like not the person next to you or three rows behind you. Uh, I would love to ask for you to consider doing that to give just a few hours of your time to create this incredible experience for everyone in our community to come and to be a part and have a safe uh, Halloween experience and get to experience a little bit of the community and the love that Lake Sawyer here has. So you can go onto the app, like Jennifer said, sign up, do it please, help us reach that goal of 75 trunks. Uh, this morning, we're kicking off a brand new series called RSVP. And uh, you know that like one of the things that you RSVP to, like the key thing you RSVP to is parties. Like all of us have RSVP'd to parties. I started to think about some of the uh, invitations and the RSVPs that I've had in my life. And uh, two years ago, I received an invitation to a party I, I honestly thought would never come. It was my 20 year high school reunion. And, uh, and I don't know where time went, but suddenly, like magically, 20 years had passed since I had graduated high school. And when I saw this 20-year high school reunion invitation, I thought to myself, there is no way I'm this old. And as I say that, I know that there's some people here who are thinking, there, there's no way your 20-year anniversary will ever come. Yet at the same time, there's others who are like, 20? Yeah, that's nothing. Like, I've gotten to my 30th my 40th or my 50th year high school reunion, um, I was just shocked. I was shocked that that much time had gone by. And when I received the invitation, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I, I, I'm a procrastinator by nature, and so I think the first time I saw it, I just kind of put it down and went on with life. But as the event got closer and closer, so did the hounding from the planning committee, more and more invitations, more and more reminders, more and more people wanting to know, are you going or not? And I think I decided kind of in that moment that I'm not really sure that I would go to my 20-year high school reunion. Now, as I say that, some of you are like, yeah, totally, like, no one goes to high school reunions. Like, high school reunions are the lamest things in the world. And maybe you think that because, like, you didn't like high school, or maybe it's just not your, your, your jam, but, like, I'm not that guy. Like, I loved high school. And I wasn't Mr. Popular. I didn't peek in high school people. The best is yet to come, okay? <laughs> I just loved it. And so like I would be the guy that you would expect to, 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 to RSVP to the 20 year high school reunion. Like I'd be the guy you'd expect to plan their whole social calendar around this event. But in this season of my life with the things that are going on right before we got to the event, I decided, you know what? I'm not going to go to my 20 year high school reunion. And, uh, and I never thought twice about it. Matter of fact, the day came and, uh, and it, didn't even, like, it didn't even, like, enter my mind. Like, I didn't realize it was the high school reunion night. And, and, and even that evening, I had, we had so much going on as a family. Like, it's just, it's nothing that kind of popped into my mind that whole day. But then the next morning, something happened. Do you know what happened? Facebook happened. And the next morning, I went on Facebook, and I went from, like, all good, okay, no regrets, to, like, full-on FOMO in, in a matter of moments. Like, I'm scrolling through the feed, and I'm like, oh, I remember that guy. Like, oh, I didn't know those people were going to be there. I, I should have gone. I would have loved to see those people. Like, I started to imagine to myself, like, all of the drama and all of, like, the, like, crazy stories and, like, stories of success and complete flameouts. Like, I missed out on all the good stuff by not going to that reunion. And in that moment, for, for a fleeting few seconds, I was just filled with regret because I didn't RSVP. I didn't attend this party. And I tell you that because all of you have had those moments in your life. Maybe it wasn't a high school reunion for you. Maybe it was a wedding. Maybe it was a birthday party. But all of us have been invited to great parties. And some of them we have RSVP'd to, to attend, and we've gone, and we've enjoyed those parties. Other times we have RSVP'd, and we've gone, and we've regretted those choices. There have been parties that we have never been invited to. And truth be told, that's probably the most difficult ones. The parties that we really want to be a part of, the parties that we wait for the invitations to come, but they never seem to come. We never have the chance to RSVP. Those are the most painful parties to miss. 
It's in those parties that we begin to question and, and, and think about our worth or our value if people respect us or love us, and we begin to feel like we're missing out. But what if I told you, what if I told you that there was a party that everyone was invited to? That literally every single person received an invitation. It didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter what you have accomplished in life. It didn't matter how much money you had. It didn't matter how little money you had. It didn't matter at all if the whole world loves you or if the whole world despises you. That this invitation to this incredible party is an open invitation to every single person in this room. And it doesn't matter at all what society says you are. The only thing that matters when it comes to this party is who God says you are. Now, I'm going to be willing to guess that there's probably some of you, if not all of you, that would be interested in an invitation to a party like that. To an epic party, a party that lasts for all eternity. And all throughout the Bible, we get glimpses. We get sneak peeks into this thing that is called the kingdom of God. And it's a place where God's reign, God is in control and he's ruling. And as we get glimpses in scripture into the kingdom of God, often what we see is that all of heaven and all of earth in the kingdom of God is in a constant state of party. That there's great things that are going on and with it comes the invitation that you and I, that all of us, are welcomed at that party. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. This morning we're going to look at a section of the Bible in the Gospel of Luke, which is one of the four books that tell us about the life and the ministry of Jesus. And Luke is telling uh, to his re recollection, his story about Jesus' life and Jesus' interactions with people. And as we pick up in Luke chapter 14, we're told that Jesus gets invited to a dinner party. And when Jesus gets invited, it is a Pharisee that invites him to the party. And a Pharisee is a religious leader for the people of Israel. And the Pharisee invites Jesus to the party. And when Jesus arrives at this party, he begins to notice what the people are doing. That when the people begin to show up, they immediately try to take their places, to take their seats next to the, to the, to the host. They're trying to take their seats next to the place of honor. Everyone in this party is trying to rank themselves. Have you ever guys been in a place like that? Like when you show up and people begin to sort themselves, to sort their order, to figure out who's most important and then consequently who's the least important. And so the party that Jesus is invited to, this is exactly what's happening. And Jesus looks around, he, he, he's taking this all in, and he's, and he's thinking to himself, this isn't the way that it should be. This isn't what parties should be like. The party that he's at is a party that divides. A party where everyone has a place, but that place is determined on your social rank. And Jesus begins to cast this vision of what a party would look like where every single person belonged. Jesus gets asked the question, and this is what he replies, and this is where we pick up in John chapter 14 and verse 16. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. So Jesus says, look, there, there's this man, he's, he's hosting this great banquet. I mean, this isn't like a little dinner party. This is an epic event. This is one of those events that is like the, the social event of the year. Like everyone wants to be at this party. And whenever you throw a party, the reality is you can't just throw a party, a huge party, an epic party with just a few people. And so the owner of this house, he's like, look, you need to go out. We need to invite as many guests as we could possibly invite. And so Jesus decides what he's going to do is he's going to send out his servant to go find those guests. And while the servant is going out and finding the guests, Jesus has to, or the, the, the host in the story, has to begin to prepare for the party. And I'm not much of a party thrower. Like, whenever we throw parties at our house, my wife does all of the work. I just get the to-do list, okay? And so when we host parties, there's like clean up the house, straighten everything up, dust all the furniture, vacuum, make sure everything's in tip-top shape. Because you want to make sure when you invite people over to your place that your house isn't filthy. You want to make sure that you don't run out of food. And so I'd be going out and making sure we have enough drinks, enough chips, enough guacamole. Like, we have all of it to host this epic party. 
And when the time finally comes for the day of this party, the host is ready. The host is expecting his guests. And again, he sends out his servant to go get those guests. And this is what we read. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everyone or everything is now ready. Come, everything is ready. The party's here. Everything's set up. It's for you. But this was their response. They all began to make excuses. Like this is one of those things for me that is surprising. Like when I think of the, the party that this host is putting on, I think about the willingness of everyone, what I would see is everyone's desire to be there. Like this is the kind of thing that people would jump at. This is the kind of party that you would, again, you would clear your calendar for. This is how I view this party. But what we're told is when the servant goes and begins to round up the people to escort them into the party, everyone begins to make excuses. Now I get it, we're all busy people. There's a lot of things that are going on, but we can all relate that there are certain parties that we would just make happen. Like if there's an invitation that came to something that was so special to us, we would just figure it out. So for example, if you received an invitation today that tomorrow the Seahawks were going to be opening up their training facility and that every single one of us got to go and to meet the coaches, the players, all the executives, shake all the hands and get all the signatures that we wanted, each and every one of you would clear your calendar. You would. If you're not, if you wouldn't clear your calendar, here's the thing, I believe you. But I also know that there is something else. That whatever that thing is, if that invitation came, that you would clear your calendar for. All of us have something in our life that we would like to be at so badly that we would move heaven and earth to make it possible. Like this is how I viewed these people. This is kind of the, the understanding. I'm thinking every single person, when they receive the invitation to this party, has got to want to come to this party. But what we're told is they all began to make excuses. There's all sorts of reasons why they wouldn't be coming. The first one, the first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. He says, he says look, I, I've just went and I purchased this field. It's, it's it's beautiful. It's 20 acres in Enumclaw. It's clear cut. It is ready to build on. Like, it is perfect, and I have to go see it. I mean, this party sounds great, but I have to go out and see what it is that I bought to see my land. So the servant's thinking, well, that's not at all what I expected you to say, but okay, fine. Like, you do what you got to do, and the servant then goes on to the next person's house. When he gets to the next person's house, I imagine he knocks on the door. The person opens the door. He says, it's the day of the party. It's time to come. And this person says this, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. So the second person says, look, I, I've gone out and I've bought these oxen, and I need to try them out. I need to make sure that they, they work. I, we don't know the particulars of this person's story. Maybe he's neglected all of the yard work that he's had to do for a long, long time. And the thing is, with oxen, like, it just significantly reduces the amount of manual labor that you have to do to care for your yard. So maybe he just needs to go out and do it because he's neglected his fields for a long, long time. More than likely... He just wants to try out his new toy. He's like, look, I, I got these oxen. Like, I got stuff I got to do. I want to go out and play with these things. And so that's what he does. He's at least cordial about it. He says, please excuse me. So the servant goes on to the next house. Knocks on the door person opens the door, and this is what that person said. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Now, 
if this person just got married, they're really starting off on the wrong foot. <laughs> like, what you should say is, I just got married. I don't want to spend a waking moment away from my beautiful bride, so I'm going to choose her over this party. But that's not what he says. This is literally throwing his wife under the bus. I just got married. It's her fault. I can't go. I've got a long list of things to do. She's, she's, I, she's difficult to make happy. So I got to make sure my wife is happy. None of these people, none of them, seem at all to be excited to go and to be a part of this party. I mean, this is an epic party. The host is prepared for this. So the best spread of food, it's going to be the best event of the season. Like, why would you make excuses not to go to this party? The way I expected these people to respond is not how they actually responded. I honestly, I expected them to respond like my youngest daughter. Yesterday, my youngest daughter and I, we went on a daddy-daughter date. And she had been planning this day for months. And, and maybe you're thinking that, like, that sounds awful that your, dad has, your daughter has to plan months in advance to get on your calendar. But like you have to understand, she wanted to find a day where as a family we had absolutely nothing going on. It wasn't a school day, it wasn't a church day, it wasn't a social gathering time. Like a full day all to herself because she wanted a full day with dad. And so we found the calendar a month in advance and it was yesterday. And for the last month, Literally every three or four days, she would let me know it was coming. She would just walk through the house and yell out, 22 days till our date. A few days would go by, 15 days till our date. Then it was seven days to our date. And I thought, okay, this is great. This is perfect. USC's in town. They're playing the Huskies. It's a 1230 game. We won't be out late. So I sit down with her and I say, hey, what if we like go to the football game where we could watch daddy's favorite team play the Huskies and it'll be a lot of fun. And how do you think that went? We did crafts all day. But she was so excited for the day. She had been anticipating the party with dad. That's how you respond to a great event. That's was supposed to be how these people responded to this event. But when the day actually arrived, none of them seemed to care. All of them had something else going on to consume their time. And imagine the servant is walking home. And he's thinking to himself, like, how do I, how do I tell the master that everyone said no? Like, no one wants to be the bearer of bad news, but when he gets home, that's what he has to do. This is what the text tells us. The servant came back and reported to his master. He says, look, I, this is what's happened. Then the owner of the house became angry. Like, the person throwing the party is furious. Like, he's done all this work, all of this preparation to give these people the kind of event that they would remember for the rest of their life, and each and every one of them has an excuse on why they can't attend. So he looks at his empty house, he looks at the decorations, he looks at the spread of food, and he tells his servant, he says, go back out quickly into the streets and alleys of town and bring in the poor, the crippled, and bl the blind, and the lame. He says to his servants, look, go out and find everyone. Again, it didn't matter their social class. It didn't matter how important or how much money they had or how little they had. He's literally, find me the poor, the crippled, the blind. Find me the lame. Find me the people that everyone in society seems to despise. These are the kind of people that I want at my party. And the host says, bring them all in. Bring everyone in to this party. And then in verse 22. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done. But there is still room. That there is still more room at this party. That there's still more space. 
And, and, and this is not the moment where the person throwing the party goes, you know what, that's fine. It's good enough. It's not like he doesn't stop and say, you know what, we have enough people to have some fun together. The master actually sends his servant back out. And this is what he tells him. He says, go out. Go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in. He says, go to the places. Go to the places that you have never gone before. Go out of the town. Go to the back alleys. Go to the country lanes. Go to the places where people like us don't commonly go and find those people. Find them and compel them, literally to press into them. Like, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to let this opportunity go by. Compel those people to get to this party. Why? He tells us. So that my house will be full. Now for this man, the party isn't for him. He's not trying to fill his house because he wants the accolades that come from throwing an epic party. He's trying to make sure his house is full so that he knows that he's done whatever he could possibly do to ensure that no one misses out on the opportunity to be a part of this party. Now, as Jesus tells the story, one of the things is pretty clear here is that Jesus is alluding to something more than a dinner party. He's not talking about a party, no matter how epic it might be, that lasts for a night. When Jesus tells this story, he's alluding to something greater. He's alluding to a party that doesn't take place here on this earth, but it's a party that lasts more than an evening. It's a party that lasts for all eternity. And as he's telling this story, he's hoping that the religious leaders and the people in the room begin to see this as, as a party for them to be at. They begin to see this invitation as one that applies to them. And the crazy thing is, to get into this party, the only thing that you need to do is to say yes. Like, if you want to get in to the party that Jesus is throwing, then the only thing that you have to do is to say yes. And I believe that saying yes to Jesus will be the most important decision that you make in this life. It will not only change your today, it will change your tomorrow, and it will forever change your eternity. And what you have to do is say yes. That's all it takes. You see, as Christians, we believe that the world that we live in is fractured and broken. That we live in a world that takes life more than it gives it. And we believe that it was into this world that Jesus entered and gave his life as a sacrifice for us. That he gave his life to bring healing to the world and to bring healing to us. That when Jesus died on the cross and when we accept his invitation to the party, that all of us are made new. That there's something new that happens because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. But each and every one of us still needs to accept that invitation. We need to decide whether or not we're going to attend this party. And there's all sorts of reasons that we can come up with with why we would say no. Very similar reasons to what we've seen in the story. I mean, some of us say, well, this party sounds great. What Jesus is talking about, it sounds amazing. Like, I want to be made whole. I want to feel healing. I want to be made new. But there's like a lot of things in life that I need to go see. Like a lot of things that I need to go out and to see, a lot of things that I need to make important to prioritize in my life. Maybe it's a, a vacation you want to go on. Maybe it's an a, 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 a experience that you want to have. But we think, Jesus, this sounds really good right now, but there are a lot of things that we want to see in life, and we need to see those things before we go and make this decision to follow Jesus, before we accept this invitation to the party. Like, I got to see things. Like, this is what the first guy said. I got a lot to see. 
And there are some of us here who, who will struggle to say yes to this invitation because this is us. Because we're not ready yet. Because there's a lot to see. And yet there's still some of us in this room who say, you know what, I, I've seen enough, but there's still a whole lot more things that I have to do. Right, that was the second guy. He's got a lot of stuff to do. He's got these oxen. He's got a field to care for. There's a lot of things that he needs to do before he can come to the party. And for many of us, we have that same feeling. Like, there's a lot of things that I need to do before I can come to this party. I need to make partner. I need to get the house that I want to get. I need to chase after the things that the world says that are important. And once I do those things, well, then maybe, maybe at that point, I'll be willing to, to say yes to this invitation that Jesus gives. And if it's not what you want to see or what you want to do, there's still some of us in this room that it's about someone. It's literally about someone in our lives. That someone we know in life claims to be a Christian. It's what they declare publicly. But you know because you see them, because you're close to them, that how they live their lives privately is completely the opposite. And maybe you've concluded, look, if that's how someone is going to live their life when they say that they're a follower of Christ, then I want nothing to do with this whole Christianity thing. And just like the third guy, we just put it on someone else. We just blame them. Look, they're hypocrites. And here's the thing. People like to say that Christians are hypocrites. Let me just make it really clear. We are. We are hypocrites. We are broken and flawed people who know that our life is not all together. That's why we've placed our trust in Jesus. Placing our trust in Jesus is not an acknowledgement of our perfection. It's an acknowledgement of our brokenness. And every day, we are working as hard as we can to be better to make this life better for someone else, and we mess up, we are hypocrites. Don't let someone else get in the way of you accepting the invitation to this party. Here's something that I know. And I know this because I haven't spent my whole life following Jesus. I know that I have spent too much time Ignoring the invitation to the greatest party ever to continually chase after a lesser version. That I spent too many years of my life ignoring the invitation to the greatest party ever because I needed to see something, because I needed to do something, or because of someone else. I ignored the invitation and I continually chased after lesser things. And maybe you're here this morning and you can relate to that as well. Maybe you've spent a lot of your life trying to find the party, the right party to be at. And you keep missing the one you belong at. You spent a lot of your life trying to figure out what's the right party for me to be at. And you've missed the one you belong at. See, the invitation to this party is clear. It's simple. Jesus gave his life on the cross. He sacrificed himself for us so that we would be made whole, so that we would have an opportunity to be made new. And the only thing that we have to do, it comes back to this, is say yes. To say yes to Jesus. Say yes to the invitation to the greatest party that has ever been thrown. And this morning, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for you. So when you came in, each of you on your seat, you got this RSVP card. And on the back of the card, you will see that it says, text YES to 360-644-1711. I know that there are some of us in this room who have never ever in our lives said yes to Jesus, who've never accepted the invitation to this party. And we want today to be your opportunity. 
And so if you would like to say yes to Jesus for the first time, this is a simple step that I want you to do. Literally just text yes to that number. And as a staff, as a church, we want to come alongside you. We want to welcome you to the party, and we want to help you take that next step. And one of the cool things about placing our life in Jesus is the opportunity that we get to declare it before all of our friends and family through what is known as baptism. And baptism, that's exactly what it is. It's a public declaration of the commitment that we've made to Jesus. It's our opportunity to say, look, through baptism, because of what Christ has done, we are declaring to everyone that we have been made new. It's a chance for us to celebrate. And so maybe you're here this morning, and again, you're saying yes. Yes to Jesus for the first time. And maybe you're thinking, well, what's my next step? What I would tell you is to be baptized. You see that all throughout Scripture, that when someone comes to understand who Jesus is and what that means for them in their lives, their next step is baptism. And so when you fill out that form, you have an opportunity to click baptism as well. And we'd love to follow up with you this week. And I also know that there are some people in this room who've said yes to Jesus a long time ago. And you're experiencing the party, you're experiencing the reality of the truth of being in, uh, in community, in life with Jesus. But maybe you've never made the decision to declare it publicly through all your friends and family through baptism. And so if that's where you're at this morning, I would invite you to say yes to baptism as well. And you can do the same thing, just text yes to this number. You can do it right now. You can take the card and do it when you get home, but don't miss the moment that you have to RSVP to the party that never ends. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your pursuit of us. I thank you that you have invited us, all of us, to something amazing. You invited us to experience a life that many of us have never thought we would experience. You've invited us to a party that lasts forever. So God, I pray that we would stop being the kind of people that chase after lesser versions, that chase after things that we think we need to do, or things that we need to see, or even we would, we would allow someone to get in the way God, I pray that we would put those aside to focus on what your son has done for us and be willing to say yes. God, I pray that you would give us the strength to step out boldly and declare that this life, my new life, begins today. And it's only possible because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, just a couple things as we wrap up this morning. We talked about it uh, last week.